Hi everybody, it's um, it's John here with another another video um, about modelling. What I want to do today is something that I've been really fancying doing for a number of weeks now. Um, there's a YouTuber who has a, a YouTube channel here on, on this uh, website uh, who's called Owl Woods Modeling Madness um, and he does a series of videos called Matchbox Mondays which I've sort of been quite interested in watching over the, uh, the last few weeks. Uh, his videos have basically been about the Matchbox models that he has actually modeled and built and how it takes him back to his childhood and to be honest with you those videos have took me back um, to my childhood because the very first uh, the very first model I ever built um, I'm thinking back now I think I was probably about seven seven or six years old was a matchbox Fockable FW190 and uh, it didn't turn out too good but then most people's first models don't do they but I did keep hold of it in my bedroom for an awful long time and god it was pretty awful um, I did move on to other brands of kits but Matchbox were, were always they were always in that shop shelf you know and I always come in and have a look and you know I did buy quite a few Matchbox kits when I was a young child so today I want to do a video overview on Matchbox models and what in my opinion Matchbox as a company has overlooked an awful lot by the modeling industry and modelers as a whole um, but I think Matchbox models have an awful lot to offer not just novice modelers um, but also younger generation modelers um, and also some experienced modelers because Matchbox has something about their kits that I think a lot of experienced modelers don't tend to seriously look at um, and I'd like to bring all of this in you know these ideas that I have in, in into the open so that people can have a have an idea of um, what I th in my opinion Matchbox offers the modeling industry. Uh, first of all before we I go into um, looking at some of the kits this video won't take an awful long time but um, I, want, I want to put the link I'm going to put a link for um, Alwood's um, channel uh, I'm going to post a link at the bottom in the um, in the comments on this video so that people can uh, have a look at his videos as well because they are quite interesting um, but I'm also going to go into some of the some of the things about matchbox kits that I think people uh, should know about because I've seen a few um, videos about models that uh, to me are obviously matchbox kits but the people who have built these kits don't realize that they're matchbox kits because they don't actually know where to look to find the evidence so I'm going to um, I'm going to do this video now but first of all I just want to give you a brief history of Matchbox models and how they came about and what happened and and how you can still find them today. Um, so basically Matchbox models began building models in 1972. The company's owner or rather owners was Jack Odell and Leslie Smith, the management of Lindsay Products and Company Limited, and they wanted to gain a share of the plastic model market. This is where a fella called Morris Landy, he was a keen aircraft person, had lots of contacts up and down the UK with um, aircraft, uh, aircraft museums, and he planned the model lineup and created the model operation for Matchbox in the early 70s. He also made all of the measurements and he's probably the man who was responsible for the great accuracy and sometimes the great howlers that Matchbox produced. Um, the illustrations and the box artwork were all performed by Roy Huxley. The company started with the purple range consisting of 19 later 20 models by the end of 1973 which included subjects as all aircraft manufacturers of models have, have covered Subjects like the Spitfire, the Hurricane, the Messerschmitt 109, the FW190, the Mustang, the Hellcats, um, they were all there. But Matchbox also included a number of exclusive kits which nobody else touched. 
And Matchbox seemed always ready to commit to the exclusive model. They never shied away from something just because nobody else touched it. And the purple range, which was what the first range of models um, became known, uh, included kits such as the Hawk of Fury, the Armstrong Basiskin and the Percival Piston Provost. They also built a couple of other kits as well and later in their three colour kit ranges because the purple kits, the purple range kits were produced in two different colours and we'll get into all of that later. But the three colour kits also included such um, rarities and exclusiveness such as the Nordine Norseman, the Dornier DO28 Sky Servant, um, just to name a few. <coughs> From these early beginnings, Matchbox went on to produce over 350 different models, including tanks and military vehicles, cars and trucks, ships and soldier figures. And all of their military kits had diorama bases and their ships were waterline kits, with the exception of the massive 172nd scale flower class Corvette. The company fell on hard times, however, during the early 1980s, and with about three takeovers in that period, um, the company fell into the hands of Ravel, who gained a 10-year lease leading up to its purchase by Ravel in 1996. 1996 was the last year the Matchbox kits were, re were re released in two colours and three colour sprues. After that term, um, ma uh, Matchbox models were released still in boxings from Matchbox kits, but they were all tended to be in grey plastic. And then by 2006, all the Matchbox models that were ever being reissued, they were all released under the Revel brand. Um, it's worthy of note, actually, that Matchbox models are periodically being re-released by um, Revel. Um, some of the Matchbox kits, uh, I am waiting for Revel to release them because some of the Matchbox kits I do remember far back were, they were gems, they were absolute gems. Matchbox were renowned for being a company that produced kits that were quite easy to build. They were often, um, they were often very bland in terms of detail and a lot of modelers, they looked at model, Matchbox models not really uh, thinking that they were serious uh, contenders for a decent option to build a model from. So Matchbox tended to be left at the wayside uh, in favour of Airfix and Revell. Uh, but to be honest with you, in the early 70s and like towards the end of the 70s and early 80s, Matchbox models uh, weren't really any less detailed than some of the early release kits that Airfix and Matt Airfix and Ravel produced anyway, especially the ones that were released as, as late as 1969 through to about 1970-75. Um, and I don't think Matchbox were really given a fair deal by the modelling industry, which is a shame really. Um, there are three key features in my opinion that Matchbox kits offer the, the modelling industry. The first and probably the most important is the fact that all Matchbox models tended to be over-engineered to ensure that they fitted together extremely well. Um, one of the things, one of my pet hates when I'm building a kit that is cheap and usually from China or Russia, is that you have to spend hours and hours and hours throughout the build just making the parts fit properly. You know, you have to sand down those dreadful location pins that always seem to be in the wrong place and then jig the kit together and then sand everything down and fill and sand and fill. And before you know it, you spend four hours just getting the airframe together to make it look right, ready to actually fill properly. Matchbox, you didn't tend to have those issues with the Matchbox kit. Some of their kits, yeah, they weren't very accurate, but they usually, t they usually tended to fit together pretty well, and pretty easily. It was very rare that you'd need more than the minimal amount of filler to put an aircraft airframe together and make it ready for paint if it was a Matchbox model. So the parts were over-engineered to ensure a fit. The second feature was the fact that the kit's simplicity of design appealed to the younger generation and the novice modelers. But the thing is, 
This gives scope for modification to experienced modelers as well, because a lot of model companies build kits, especially companies like Airfix and Academy and Revell now, they build a lot of models that have an awful lot of detail inside them. And to all intents and purposes, if this detail is found to be incorrect, a modeler would require to uh, take a lot of this detail out of the parts that build the model up before they can scratch build the, the parts to put them in to, to produce a modification in the first place. So in my opinion, matchbox models will save uh, experienced modelers an awful lot of time because they're not stripping out stuff that, that they don't want in the kit. They're just, they have like a blank canvas and you can do an awful lot with, with a lot of matchbox kits because they have an awful lot of room inside their blend interiors. Um, the third thing, and possibly uh, one of the things that, in, that encouraged me to model when I was young, was the fact that matchbox models are usually made in either two or three different colors. They come on perfectly sized sprues for the box. There are a lot of times where I've seen in reviews and a lot of modelers videos on YouTube where they say, I've opened this enormous box and inside the kit was only like a quarter of the size of the box. Every, every matchbox model that I've ever opened, it's virtually full of sprue. The kit's sprues fitted the box sizes perfectly. Um, there was very little waste in the boxing space. Uh, and this, in my opinion, and also the fact that they were two or three colours, made the kits really appeal to the younger generation because they felt they had good value for money. And also, Matchbox tended to build the models using different colour sprues, which sort of reflected what the aircraft would generally look like in real life. So the younger generation and the inexperienced modellers could build a Matchbox kit without using any paint whatsoever, put the markings on, and it would be a pretty good representation of what the real aircraft looked like in terms of overall colours. Um, yeah, some of them were pretty vibrant, but that was on purpose as well. I remember the Boeing P-12E, I think I have got that kit in my stash, but the Boeing P-12E I can remember was bright yellow and brown. And one of the versions was actually bright yellow and brown which was in I always found, yeah, that's really interesting. So a younger generation or say a youngster could build the kit, put the markings on, let it dry for like a day. And then the next day they could, they could play with it like a toy. Um, I certainly did when I was younger. The next thing I want to quickly go through is the chronology of boxes, because the older the matchbox kits are generally, the more money you have to pay for them. And I want to just, introduce you to the different styles of boxing leading up to the Revell release boxing so that you can you can ID how old some of these kits are. Now when the purple range was released and I'm pretty sure the purple range was the only range that was released with the box the type 1 boxing and basically the type 1 boxing this is a type 1 box match box model this is the Harrier GMR1 um, and I'll talk about this kit soon as well because this kit is, yeah, it's got some issues. But basically the Type 1 boxing was a small box like this with a lid that just came straight off the top. So it basically had a lid, a flip lid. Um, and these kits were produced with the Type 1 boxing from 1972 to about 1974. And the Type 1 led into the Type 2 boxing, and the box looks exactly the same. The only difference is the Type 1 boxing did not have a window in the back. The Type 2 boxing did. It had a window slit, so you could see the different colour sprue inside the box. And the other difference was is that the box didn't have a flip lid anymore. It had an open end. And you, you open the kit. This one doesn't want to open but you open the kit by opening up the ends 
and pulling the parts out from one end instead of just opening up the whole lid. That was a Type 2 box and these kits tended to be released on the Type 2 box between 1974 and about 1977. Um, type 1 boxes in a purple range, you can still usually get them for about 5 quid, 5 or 6 quid, but in the Type 2 boxings, um, the ones that aren't rare, you can usually get for four, four pound, four, five pound at the most. Um, but there are some rare uh, kits, and I'll talk about those in the video later as well. Some of the some of the Matchbox models are very rare and difficult to get hold of, and they usually fetch quite a bit of money. The Type Three boxing was similar to the Type Two boxing, but it had a variation in the uh, the actual font that explained and described the contents of the box. The font was a different colour, it tended to be black. Um, and also the, um, I'll just quickly show you, the type, the type 3 box, this is a type 2 box as I said before, and it, the type 3 box had a surround, it was like um, a border that went round the Matchbox logo. And that was a Type 3 box, but otherwise it was very similar to the Type 2 box. And those tended to uh, phase in from about 1977 to about 1978. They weren't used for very long. And then towards the end of the 70s, um, you had a Type 4 box, which was very similar to the Type 3 box. Um, but again, they changed, they changed the border of the actual box itself. And they also changed the font slightly and some of the, the positioning of the 172nd scale and two colour kit logos on the boxing. And then in about 1980, Matchbox run into financial difficulty and they were purchased by a company in Hong Kong. Um, I can't remember what the damn company was called, but the, guy, the guy's name was David Ye. Um, I think it was Hong Kong Toys or Toyo Toys Limited or something like that. And basically, um, the company changed the format of how the boxes looked, but they didn't change the contents. The kits were still in two colours or three colours, but basically the Type 4 box had now had a black surround around the actual kit's uh, art, artwork, and they did away with the rear window in the back. The kit opened up in exactly the same way as a Type 2, 3 and 4 box. Um, but these models tended to come on the market in about um, 1980. They tended to be coming in around about 79 to 80. And then they carried through until about 19, I would say 1990-ish. Maybe 92 at the most. These, these kits in this style of boxing are probably the cheapest models that Matchbox that you'll be able to get second hand on the, on the eBay, sites like eBay and Amazon and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> and then in 1996, Ravel came on the scene. Um, Ravel actually purchased a 10 year lease for the right to sell Matchbox models. Um, not under the Ravel brand, still under the Matchbox brand, but to take the operation from Hong Kong and operate Matchbox models from Germany. And the Type 5 and 6 boxings were similar to this. And they had a big massive difference in these. They went back to the flip top lid style. This box lid comes off like the old type ones, right? But there's there's no window in the back, obviously. They went over to the Ravel style instruction leaflets, and then we had the first big massive change. The sprues were all one colour. They did away with the two colour plastic kits, and they started producing all their models in one colour plastic. Uh, they were usually grey as well. It's quite rare to find different colours. But they still released all of the Matchbox range. But they tended to do them in these black border boxes with single colour plastic sprues inside, making the models. 
and these kits were released on in this format for about 10 years until about 2006 when Revell purchased Matchbox lock stock and barrel and all the rights to uh, do whatever they wanted to do with, with uh, Matchbox as a company and it's interesting that the model that I've got to show you um, is the first ever Matchbox model ever released. This is this is the Revell Hawker Fury Mark I, but it's actually the very first Matchbox release kit, PK1, plastic kit model one from the Purple Range, originally released in 1972. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. And basically, I'll just open this, this kit up just to show you what you get now in a, in a Revell marketed matchbox kit. You get a nice Revell instruction leaflet, which is in Revell format. The thing is, everything in it is a sort of a hybrid between matchbox and Revell. And whenever you get a Revell kit, which was originally a matchbox kit, you you get this hybrid sort of instruction leaflet and it's really weird because this is Revell, right? you got a lovely picture on the top. Every Revell kit has instructions in it. You always have a nice picture of the model on the top. On the second page, these key features down here, these were features of Matchbox. These features were all on Matchbox instruction leaflets. <coughs> This is a feature of Revell kits where you have the parts plan on the sprues to ID where the, where the parts are on the sprues. And then all of these drawings here are virtually taken straight from the Matchbox instruction plans. So it is a true hybrid of plastic parts and instructions, even the decals. The colour code plan and the stencil diagram to put all the markings on is actually a a Revell trait. You tend to get this type of um, effort on their instructions to explain where the um, the markings go and the paint and how to paint the aircraft up. And Matchbox tended to do all of that on their the boxes. It tended to have all that on the boxes. So you know it is a hybrid. You have got features of Matchbox kits and features of Revell kits when you when you're still buying a Matchbox model. Now, when I said to you that all of their sprues tended to fit their boxes completely, this is proof of this, because this is the Matchbox kit and this is the Revell kit, right? The box for the Revell kit is larger. The Matchbox kit is a smaller box, but this sprue fits into this box perfectly. And that's the first way you can tell a Matchbox model in a Revell box is by the sprues. The sprues will tend to be slightly smaller than the box, but they'll be about the same shape. The other way to prove a Matchbox model, um, I remember seeing a review of the Revell Hawker Fury on YouTube, and the guy wasn't sure. He wasn't 100% sure whether it was a Matchbox kit. But he was pretty sure, but he wasn't 100%. I'm going to show you now how you can tell a Matchbox kit that's in a Revell box. On the sprues, when you had a Matchbox kit, it had the PK number and Made in England written on the sprue. And if you look, if you look very carefully at this, if I can show you. Hopefully I'll show you without opening the box. Um, on the top of here, you've got two ID fillets on the sprues. And basically, I'll turn it over because I can't read it when it's round, round the other way because my camera tends to mirror image everything. But basically, on the top of here, on this window, you've got the part, you've got the model PK number, which is PK1. The Fury, remember, was PK1. It was the first Matchbox model ever released by Matchbox. And on this, this little tag here on the sprue, it's got Made in England. Well, 
I'll categorically tell you that everything that Ravel build that is a Ravel original is made in Germany. The Ravel reissues of Matchbox are made on sprues in a factory in Germany. This kit should not have made in England on it, but it has because the sprues were, were made on a jig that was originally made in England. So also <clears throat> there's another there's another interesting thing. On this sprue here you've got the two fuselage halves top and bottom. Right? If I turn this over the other way, you probably won't be able to see them very easily. But on the inside of the fuselage halves, you've got a little bit of stamping in here, and it, it actually says Lisney Productions Company Limited, and then it's got Matchbox and 1972. That proves it's a Matchbox kit. It will have Matchbox printed on the inside of virtually every large piece. Um, it'll only be once. <laughs> it won't be on every large piece, but somewhere on one of the large pieces attached to one of the screws, it will have Lisney Productions Co, uh, Co Company Limited, and then it will be the year that the actual jig was built to produce the first ever sprue that came off it and with the fury it was 1972 sorry that's the fury so that's your boxings your boxing history and everything i just want to show you um what you get as a finished product because i've recently finished a matchbox military vehicle um, and the thing with the military vehicles and again when you buy a revel military vehicle or a tank the way you can tell that it's an X matchbox kit is by looking for the PK number on the sprue and maybe the Lisney Productions Company Limited and the date stamp on the inside of one of the large pieces of plastic that are attached to the sprue but with the military vehicles every matchbox model was released with a diorama base and this is the finished product of what you get when you buy a Ravel M16 half track. Hopefully I can show it you. There we go. There's the M16 half track. This kit was a Ravel boxing of the M16 half track, but the model itself was an X matchbox kit. Um, I can't remember the actual date stamp, but it did have Lins Lisney product productions company limited and a date stamp printed on one of the, the the vehicle sites on the inside of one of the vehicle sites and every military matchbox model whether it's a tank or whether it's a military vehicle will have a diorama base just like this this particular one um, I'm not showing you this for the quality of the build or anything this particular one um, <clears throat> Is built in three parts um, and under this plaque here you can see on the plaque it's actually got Revell AG but underneath this plaque would have been a, a date stamp and Lin, Lisney Productions Company Limited and a date stamp the model was built I think this kit was originally made in about 1980 um, but uh, I, I enjoyed building this kit because like all matchbox models it, it flew together like a dream and half tracks I usually have issues with half tracks fits because I can never damn well fit them together very easily um, but that one fitted together like a dream uh, and it's quadruple anti-aircraft mount swivels like that turns around uh, turns around nice and easy and it's even got a nice little gunner figure in there you can see them in there which is really nice the kit uh, the kit went together like a dream Matchbox built a lot of warships as well. Uh, some of them were modern, some of them were World War II. And one of the things that I quite liked about the Matchbox warship range was the fact that they were all waterline. They had no hulls below the decks. So when you finished building them, you could get them out and you could diorama them or you could play with them on the living room floor carpet or, you know, you, you could do an awful lot more with them than you could with kits that had hulls below the waterline 
because all you could do with those is display them on a stand. Um, you couldn't diorama them without chopping the bottom off or sinking them into lots of um, material to reenact an ocean, which I quite liked. I, I thought, you know, I thought that was a good idea. I just quickly want to go through um, a couple of things that I haven't gone through yet. Uh, Matchbox, they built some of the, the most charming and accurate kits that I can ever remember seeing in 172nd form and, and in other scales as well. Matchbox won't try to build other scales as well. Um, the best kit options by memory, Matchbox did a Nordine Norseman. It was an exclusive kit to, to Matchbox. And it's a beautifully molded, really nice, accurate kit of the Nordine Norseman. They also built a Ling Temco Vault Corsair 2, which is another uh, really nice, really accurate kit. And it has a nice feature on that one is that, is that it had folding wings um, like the real Corsair does. Matchbox did a Fiat Airtalia G91Y, which is the twin engine version of the Fiat Gina. Uh, that was a nice, really accurate, lovely little kit. It was really lovely. I did build one last year. Um, very, very nice. I might do a, a video of some of the kits that I built over the last five or six years since getting back into this game. Um, Matchbox also did uh, two versions of the English Electric Lightning. They did a box single seat F2A and F6, and they also exclusively did the T5 and T55 model Lightning Trainer. Um, I don't remember ever seeing a 72nd scale side-by-side 2 -side seat Lightning Trainer done by anybody else. Uh, there are a few kits that Matchbox build that you need to be wary of, um, because Matchbox did build a certain number of pretty awful howlers. PK5, the the Brigitte Dornier Alpha Jet first tooling was probably one of the worst of their howlers they ever molded. Uh, it was originally molded on the wooden mock-up, but this kit was corrected in 1982 by the second generation tooling, which revised the aircraft's airframe and made the fin totally different and much more representative of the real aircraft. Uh, PK-16 was the Hawker Siddeley Harrier. I showed you that earlier, and that was in the Type 1 box, remember? Well, the Harrier has serious issues around the front airframe in that the nose, the cockpit, the air intakes uh, are pretty awful. They're to, they're, they don't even look like a, a GR1 Harrier. And even the wings, the actual main wing itself, I don't think it's the right shape. Um, the three colour kit of the Westland Lynx is a nice kit, but you have to remember it's, it's of the prototype Navy Lynx and it had three side windows and the side doors. Um, and also PK-121, the Fairchild A-10A, um, was actually moulded on the wooden mock-up and not on the production aircraft. And the kit was actually released before the Thunderbolt 2 was named the Thunderbolt 2. At the time the kit was released, it was still called the Fairchild A-10A. Uh, so <clears throat> you have to look around for these howlers. They did do a few other aircraft, which uh, a few other kits actually, not just aircraft, which are actually charming models. Most of their military kits were extremely good. Um, I can't remember ever seeing a really bad military vehicle or tank that Matchbox built, and all their dioramas are very interesting. Some of them uh, are quite small, but some of them they they give an ambience to the kit when it's built um, with, like I've not seen in any other brand. Uh, Matchbox also built the Flower Class Corvette which was a anti-submarine Corvette um, used during World War II and Matchbox molded it in 172nd scale with a full hull and that kit is absolutely awesome. If you ever get a chance to build it buy it because it's, it's an awesome model, it's gorgeous. Um, Matchbox built models in 
a variety of different scales, leading from about 1 370th for some of their airliner kits, going through to 144th, 72nd, uh, 48th, 32nd, and 124th scale. They also did a few motorcycles, I believe, in 112th, um, which were interesting as well. But most of their aircraft kits are really, really good uh, in terms of accuracy and everything. Um, and, but they also did a range of models. Um, I can't remember what colour the model range was, but it was of their 132nd scale aircraft range. Um, and some of them were a bit tricky to build. The Spitfire, I remember, was a bit tricky to build, but it is of an F-22, F-24. But they do two absolutely glorious kits in 32nd scale. The Sea Venom is, I've built the Sea Venom, it was a long time ago, but it is absolutely incredibly good. It's, it's really detailed for what it is. Um, and also, Matchbox produced the Puma helicopter in 32nd scale. And that kit, although it's probably not much more detailed than the Airfix 72nd scale Puma. It's a very impressive and very accurate rendition of the Puma in 32nd scale. And it, in my opinion, if you are a serious modeler and you want to have a bash at something a bit out of the ordinary, if you can get the Matchbox Puma, get it. Because it's gone. It's, it's, another, it's another gorgeous kit. So hopefully this video has brought you some idea of why um, I believe Matchbox has a lot to offer um, and also I hope that you know you might be tempted to go out and have a bash at you know buying them and building them because they are very quick and easy to build they're quite enjoyable to build they're easy to paint um, there's not a huge number of stencils and transfer sheets ever and the, in my opinion they're just they're just a nice easy kit to build and you can try out lots of different trends and lots of different ideas and you can build up your skills with them too. So not too expensive to buy, providing you don't get some of the uh, rare ones. Um, and if you fancy having a go at something that's easy and quick to build, get yourself a matchbox kit. I've got a few in my stash and I'm looking forward to building them. So uh, hopefully this video has been of some use to you and I'll see you with the next one. Happy modeling. Bye-bye.